contrary to what you might think or believe, K-12 science education is heading in a great direction in the United States. And I'm confident that educators will continue to encourage their students into STEM careers. I'm also optimistic that students will respond to this call. We have a lot to um, be proud of, but it's also to keep in mind where we're coming from. We've transitioned away from the typical textbook memorization that many of you in the audience who are older might remember from science coursework in high school or in middle school. Mm -hmm. And that's mostly because the internet has done a very good job leveling the playing field, providing equal access to pretty much anyone who has an internet or IP address uh, connection to find, to look through. You know, information is there at the touch of uh, a button or in your phone. And um, it's, it's not like, we're ignoring this, this method or this memorization. We still need it, but it's more today about how you use it. And that's really what I want to talk about today in this uh, discussion of college science education. Now, in K through 12, we have a lot of great things happening, like I said. We have common core state standards. I know you might be thinking, oh, I've heard of that. The next generation science standards are up and coming through um, K through 12 education, and I'm looking forward to seeing those in New York State as well. Um, we have New York State science standards of inquiry, um, and then we also have a lot of STEM sponsorship from public and private tech industries for our students. So we're really focused on the nature and the process and the method of science. Not so much predetermined outcomes anymore, you might remember a lab where predetermined outcomes were something that you were shooting for, but we're not as focused on that as much in, in K through 12. We're really focused on the skills of argument, communication, analysis, interpretation, evaluation, reflection, and experimental design. These are not skills that are limited to or exclusive to science education, but it has been a long time coming to see these skills enter science education for a subject that most American students didn't really care for in school. Imagine putting yourself in the shoes of someone who had a good science education, K through 12. Great, you're off to college, you arrive, you start taking your first introductory classes, and there it is, that textbook memorization again. You're reading from the textbook, these basics, these formulas, the jargon of the scientific field, and then you're tested on it, exam after exam. It, it kind of, feels wrong. It feels like we're not continuing where we started in K through 12 if you had a great education in science education. What happened to process? What happened to experimental design? And what happened to inquiry? We live in a time where STEM literacy is really important at every level. We have climate change telling us that natural disasters are more frequent these days, economic recklessness, deceptive media, we have agricultural crises across the world. And maybe you don't need a degree in science education, but it would be helpful to have a basic understanding. If we're not continuing the educational initiatives in science in college that we started in K through 12, then how are we really serving our youth best? How can you ensure that when you get to college, yes, you, Hunter students in the audience, when you get to college, that it's going to live up to your expectations and you're going to enjoy it? When our country needs STEM literacy and we want to take a, a next step forward to a scientifically literate public body, this becomes a real problem. So we're going to backtrack a little bit. I need to tell you what that looks like. And I'm fortunate enough to have professional and academic experiences in my life at this point to offer both a teaching example and a learning example, both sides of the coin, if you will. So we'll start with teaching. I'm a teacher of earth science at the Urban Assembly School for Global Commerce in East Harlem. And last year, I taught ninth and 10th grade earth science. And we studied plate tectonics, volcanoes, um, earthquakes. One of the things I wanted my students to do was learn about a supervolcano that's essentially in their geologic backyard. I'm sure many of you guys have heard of Yellowstone National Park, supervolcano, large magma chamber, not such a great place to be if the, the uh, volcano erupts. It's not such a great place to be here in New York City if the volcano erupts. And I told my students this is a, a favorite place of mine to visit. I was there this past summer. It was great. Um, but they said, you're crazy. Why would you go there? You're endangering your life. And 
all the people that go there are endangering their lives. So I said to them, okay, convince me. Convince me that I shouldn't go there. Convince me that the National Park Service should close down the park to the, to the public and basically stop us from going to this beautiful, beautiful place that is dangerous but also brings a lot of tourism and recreation every year. And so I had them write essays. They had to research the ecology, the uh, health and safety, the tourism economics, and they had to present their findings to me as an essay. This is the kind of work that scientists do every day. They do research, and then maybe at the most elite level, because we're talking about scientists, they present their work. They argue based on evidence and fact that they have in front of them. So that's, that's a, an example of a teaching inquiry in high school. Um, and that's what students should be doing at high school level. Let's pop over to the learning example. We need to rewind back to when I was a sophomore in college. I took a course called Chemical Ecology, where the class was centered around the chemically mediated interactions of organisms at all levels. But we were really probing and trying to isolate the chemistry to better understand all systems of chemical ecology through learning the methods and experimental design behind that. And I didn't do amazing in the course. I worked my butt off, but I didn't do amazing. However, and this is also because coincidentally my academic major lined up well, I landed a job with the professor of the course. And his name is Dr. Robert Raguso, one of my mentors from college. Um, I'll show you a picture. Oh, so this is me teaching. And then here is um, my lab group in summer 2011. Um, just a nice outing. And uh, he had me learn lab techniques. And he had me read seminal publications in chemical ecology. And he was focused on me learning the process and the design. But I think the most formative experience I had in inquiry with Dr. Aguso was when he took me to the wildflower garden at Cornell. And we looked at the colors, and, the, and we smelled the smells, and we saw the insects visiting and pollinating flowers. And he said to me, design an experiment to isolate the primary attractant for this insect visiting that flower. Why do they visit that flower over any other flower? And it's those kind of experiences in the garden, outside, or in a lab meeting discussing someone's work, or in a greenhouse taking care of the moths that we studied um, that I learned so much more from a textbook. And it's amazing how much you can learn from rearing a colony of moths, which is part of the research that I was in. Of course, I screwed up a lot. I broke the gas chromatography machine. I carelessly murdered innocent caterpillars. Why am I smiling? Um, <laughs> I set moths free on the, on the roof of the greenhouse Moths peed on me. Um, I did not pee on the moths. I miscalculated pupation rates. That's disgusting. I misused jargon all the time. And there was even this autoclave incident down on the first floor where I steamed up the entire building. And the building manager got really mad at me. Yeah. So I made a lot of mistakes. But they were the best mistakes I ever made. And they taught me how to do good science. My advisor accepted this process. And he invested himself in my learning even if it proved calamitous at times. So what I'd like to do for you now is read his philosophy, which you can find on his website, about his undergraduate mentoring. Students are the lifeblood of a vibrant scientific laboratory. Incoming students bring novel ideas, perspectives, and energy to the group, whereas more established students help put those ideas to the test through experimental design, analysis, and interpretation. I've benefited from working with engaged, dedicated mentors at every step of my education, and I'm committed to training students at all levels of experience to develop their skills as scientists, scholars, and critical thinkers. When students show initiative and dedication, they might develop projects of their own through independent study. I do not hand students safe projects that I know in advance will work out, nor do I let students flail without any guidance. We typically discuss an interesting paper or lecture to develop a research theme, then work together to design appropriate experiments, learn the necessary analytic tools, and set up a timeline by which the students can remain productive in the lab while maintaining their academic schedule. Wouldn't you like to work for someone like that? Who can foster your own inquiry and learning, but through process and the nature of science rather than regurgitation of information? It's that that you're looking for in a college science education. 
you need to put inquiry before your GPA. I took a calculus-based astrophysics course when I first arrived at Cornell University. And while all my friends were being razzle-dazzled in Astro 101 with pretty pictures, I was calculating how quickly a star would collapse if you turned off nuclear fusion. So that was pretty cool. But is there a risk in sacrificing possibly your GPA to push your curiosity, to drive yourself, to be inquisitive, to challenge yourself, and to surround yourself with these challenges all the time? and not safety nets. You can take the safe route. You can keep track of your GPA and, and take the courses you know will be fine because that's your strength. Or you can push the boundaries and you can learn something new. I took classes in ecology, anthropology, climate science, dendrochronology, and I even took a class at Ithaca College in audio production just because I felt like it. <laughs> but amidst those great classes where I was pushing my own understanding, I took the really bad classes here and there as well where I literally felt like every day in lecture, I was just going to class to write down what's on slides and then regurgitate that for the test. And it's those experiences, possibly in your intro biology courses or even intro earth science, that you're really gonna underserve yourself in college. You need to be appreciative of the practice and the nature of science in formal learning. So what's the takeaway? Find someone to foster your inquiry it is practiced, it is not memorized. And forget perfectionism. It casts a shadow over inquiry, creativity, and evaluation of your own work. It's not very conducive to a critically thinking scientific mind. My message to you students out there who are gonna pursue science in college, take field or lab classes without pre-designed experiment outcomes. Push yourself to do research. Find an advisor who balances his schedule more toward mentoring students than just workhorsing. And take classes outside your interests because you do need to push your interests. You need to broaden your perspective. It'll help you in all facets of your academic or professional experience. I typically value 90% of my learning in the sense that I want to learn 90% of something that I'm interested in. That last 10% will take a lifetime to learn and typically, if you're gonna take a class in any discipline, one or two classes satisfies learning 90% of that entire discipline. You can learn a lot by taking one class. Okay, so the students in the audience who wanna study science, you know what to do. I've told you this. Hopefully you act on it. <laughs> students who are not going to study the sciences but may have to take a course, why do this? Well, it helps your understanding of how things work. At the most basic level, you can fix appliances when your mother asks you to. You can drive your car better. You can anticipate and make better predictions physiologically, mechanically. You can better professional plan in your life. And it teaches you to value evidence for argument of skills that you might need in, uh, in the workforce or even at home. And I think I like this one as, as, uh, as probably the most important. You can be a better statistician of your own work and evaluate how you're doing and make uh, decisions on that. So what are the implications? Why does this matter? Like I said earlier, we need a scientifically liter literate public moving forward for legislation, for policy decisions in the face of incredible, naturally changing, quickly changing uh, environment. We need to do science for science's sake. Pushing the boundaries of common knowledge is a noble and true endeavor. And anyone who takes it on knows that it's challenging, but it is worth it. And then lastly, your personal interests. Maybe you want to study science. Maybe that's something that you've always wanted to do and you want to satisfy your curiosity. These are all good reasons to study science in college, but you need to be careful about what you do when you get there and what classes and experiences you choose. Before I end, I'd like to read you a quote from a man named John Dewey who published in 1910 in Science Magazine. And he says, Science teaching has suffered because science has been so frequently presented just as so much ready-made knowledge, so much subject matter of fact and law, rather than as the effective method of inquiry into any subject matter. And his words are no less relevant today. Thank you. <laughs>